Hello and welcome. You know, isn't it funny looking back over our lives um, so far, how far back that we can actually recall um, quite vividly either an event or a conversation that we've had um, and how that actually remains in our long-term memory pretty much for life. I mean, throughout our lives, we have a count, like countless immeasurable amount of conversations. So why do we remember some and not others? Um, I think it possibly could be something to do with the fact that those particular conversa conversations hit an emotional chord in us um, and that we know that it's the truth. And for that reason, it sort of imprints an emotion in our hearts and our mind that sticks. Um, okay, Rach, why are you saying this? I can hear you probably thinking at the back of your mind. Well, I remember really quite, and it's vivid, a very vivid conversation I had 14 years ago. It's a very long time ago with a client about um, how hard she was finding the transition from one to two children. Um, and I clearly remember her standing in front of me um, and saying no one ever talks about the transition and how hard it is to balance looking after a newborn and a toddler, um, which for some reason that really stuck with me. Um, and I remember her saying, you know, they, meaning I guess the experts and, and, and everyone in general, um, you know, give you all the supportive information about how to look after your first child, but nothing really how to cope uh, with the struggles of balancing the two. And I just guess all the struggles that parents go to, I go through, sorry. So, you know, all these years later, 14 years later, here we are. And I'm really thrilled um, that this memory has popped back up for whatever reason, but it has. Um, and to be having this conversation with you today, um, and to introduce our special guest and one of our partners here, Belinda Joyce. Um, now, Belinda is a midwife, a maternal and child health nurse with over 20 years experience. Um, and she's also a mother of four children and the author to, to the book, which is just over her right shoulder, which you can see there, enjoy, uh, survive and enjoy your baby. And um, her passions are in, uh, in providing safe, evidence-based advice um, and options to parents so they can find their own path to parenthood. Thanks for joining us. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks, Rach. Yeah, well, isn't this strange? I mean, have you ever had something like this happen before where you just remember something that's been tucked away in your long-term memory and all of a sudden you're like, where did that memory come from? I mean, I don't know. Has that happened to you before? Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, and it's so strange, I guess, when preparing for this chat today, this, that this particular memory popped up. And as I said, it was a long time ago. Um, but I, like I was saying, I think maybe the reason it's, it's stuck with me is because there is a lot of truth in this. What are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely, there is. And I think um, to a certain extent, if someone's already had a baby, society and probably most of the experts think, well, they know what they're doing now. They're having yeah. another baby. They've done this before. Yeah. But of course, it, every baby is so different. And having a baby and a toddler or a baby and a preschooler, that's a whole different juggle. Um, so it's fair to see, um, I guess, pregnant women having their second baby being quite nervous and a little bit worried about it. Yes. And, you know, talking about um, important conversations, the all important conversation that you have with your child to actually to let them know they're about to share their life with a new baby brother or sister is most definitely one of those important conversations conversations um, that you remember, of course, for the rest of your life. Um, so I'd love to know, how do you know when the right time is to have that conversation with your child? I think it's the sort of conversation that you can have throughout the pregnancy. Pregnancies are nine months long. Um, probably really important not to start the conversation until you're happy for everyone to know that you're pregnant because toddlers and preschoolers will share that information with others no filter. Um, and let the, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so once everyone else is allowed to know, I think it's really important to start including them in all the conversations around, you know, you're going to be a big brother or sister. Um, we're having a new baby. And mm -hmm. as your tummy grows, um, letting them actually put their hand on your tummy and start feeling the baby kicking and seeing how your tummy's growing letting them talk to their new baby brother or sister. Um, it depends on their age as well, but it's, it's a really important conversation, like you said. 
Yeah. Well, let's chat more about that conversation um, that you have with your child in, in just a moment. Um, but to, to preface, I guess, part of the stuff that we, we're going to speak about today, you know, the general preference for most Australian families is to have a smaller family with one to three children. Um, and in most circumstances, it's more of a strategic decision, isn't it, about ensuring that parents can provide um, a sound economic future for their children. Um, and it's hard to say what the I, I, ideal amount of children is. It's a very personal decision to make. But in saying this, you're actually a mum to four children. So you actually fall outside the norm, having a little bit of a larger family. So I'd love to know from your perspective and what you're happy to share with us, you know, how did you personally manage the transition from one to four kids? <laughs> you're a superstar. <laughs> oh, well, thankfully they were all single babies we didn't have any multiples um so that would have well that definitely made it a lot easier but the transition from one to two was was definitely the hardest um it, they were the closest together as well 21 months apart so we had two well it felt like we had two babies they were both in nappies they both needed naps they needed naps at different times um it it was quite challenging but also very rewarding and that of course those kids are very close um, and then going to three and going to four we had a slightly larger gap so they weren't as close together but then we had all the logistics of getting children to kindergarten and school drop-offs and pickups whilst you've got a baby waking them up putting them in the car <laughs> those sort of things that you would probably never do with your first baby you have to do with second third and fourth babies so um yeah it was different every time but I think to a certain extent you do get used to it as well yeah and on a professional uh, for, from a professional perspective you know, as a midwife um, a maternal and child health nurse with over 20 years experience you probably would have seen and heard I guess almost everything um, but I'd love to know from your perspective you know what are the main questions and or concerns that you've heard over the over the years from parents about how to embark on the transition from one to two and or more kids? I think most new or pregnant women um, will say to me that they're, they're concerned about how they're going to split their time, how they're going to get everything done because they remember just with one baby how busy they were over a 24-hour period um, and, and just knowing how they're going to fit it all in and also how they're going to look like they're doing it all because in our society we really do expect mums um, and mums expect it of themselves in return to be able to do it all. Um, so I think the most important thing to know is that they need to ask for help and that they can't do it all um, and that that's okay. Yeah. Is there anything else that, that sort of popped up or that's the main one, the main concern? I think they're the main, that's the main one. Then there's all the, um, you know, making sure you've got all the right equipment because now you've got to fit two car seats in the car and a, a pram that perhaps fits too and, and those kind of things. So that's more around how to get yourself all really well set up for that second child. But I think the main thing is actually fitting in time with both children and not robbing from your first child who's had you all to themselves yes up until course. then <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you know birth order can um commonly sort of contribute to differences in in personality um as well as we know from a psychological perspective um and this is i think a larger conversation for another day which i'd love to be able to have because i think this is something to really sort of to deep dive into but i just wanted to know what your personal experience is um with this in particular Look, there's lots of theories around birth order and it is really interesting and it certainly has played out with my four children. I hope they're not watching this. Um, <laughs> so the firstborns commonly become uh, more sort of leaders, uh, more goal orientated, perhaps a, a bit more academically um, high achieving and um, a bit more responsible because they've been asked to help out with their siblings on many occasions um, and perhaps at times given a little bit too too much responsibility just out of need to get everything done by the parent um, and then middle children or second children um, this only well 
so long as they're not the youngest, really. It depends how many children you have. Um, but typically get middle child syndrome. And that's where they've almost been left to their own devices quite a lot, become very resourceful, um, might feel a little bit um, forgotten at times, because especially if there's three or more children, uh, because they're there's the oldest who's craving the attention that they've always had and then there's always the baby as well. So um, they can become really amazing adults, obviously, with those skills. Uh, and they're often quite social as well. Um, might head out with friends a bit more often because they're, they're looking for um, connection with people outside of the family a little bit more as well. Mm. And then you have the, um, the baby of the family and they can remain the baby of the family forever, um, which means they can sometimes be doted on a little bit, treated just that bit differently because they were always the baby. So perhaps they nearly always get their own way. Um, they can be, become a little bit um, manipulative, you know, well, I'm the baby, so, I, you know, you've <laughs> got to give it to me or you've got... <laughs> Um, and of course, these are all generalizations. It's not, and there's yeah, really amazing positives for every, um, every stage of birth order as well. Um, but it is, it's a really interesting theory. Yeah. I definitely want to delve into this, um, you know, um, on a larger scale at another, another time, but getting back to what we're here to chat about today. And let, let's just talk about the article that we published for you. The, the title of it is Tips for Transitioning from One to Two Kids. Now, for someone who hasn't read the article yet, could you please give us an overview of what it's about and just tell us what inspired you to write it? Sure. Um, I wanted to just give a bit of generalised information around what um, parents often are concerned about moving from one to two children and then a whole heap of practical strategies that you can actually implement um, before the birth and also after, just, yeah. just to set you up for success. There's some really great lists in the article, which we, as we always do, have a link in the show notes. Um, so, and we're going to speak about them a little bit more now as well. Um, but, you know, I guess this conversation that parents are having with their child may be, you know, and most possibly the first time um, that the child's had to grasp the concept of a baby growing inside their mummy's belly um, and understanding that um, each conversation that parents have with the child has to be age appropriate. So it depends, as you mentioned earlier on in the chat, the conversation does need to be age appropriate. Um, but from your perspective, like what are your thoughts on how much of the truth that the, the parents should tell the children? Like, what are your thoughts? I think age appropriate. Um, conversations are really important but you'd be surprised what even a child under two can understand and it's worth giving them a little bit more information than perhaps what you think they can understand to see it to see their response and to see what they can grasp um, I think the conversations I had with my first child um, so she wasn't even two yet when her baby brother was born mm -hmm. uh, she didn't really understand until the birth of the baby, but she was very well prepared. I think um, being a girl as well, she really wanted a doll, a life-size doll that she could dress and um, bath and do all of those things with. And so she didn't really understand that a baby also cries a lot and requires lots of feeding and time and, and those kind of things. But she took to it pretty well and we were just honest with her with the majority of our conversations and that's what we did with our subsequent children as well. Yeah. Um, and I think being honest and letting them know what's coming really sets them up to be able to understand better and to cope better with all, all of the changes because there are going to be a lot of changes in their little world. Yes. Yeah. And just, as you said, being honest, but also just giving children the respect that they deserve to be able to let them know as well, as you said, that their little world is going to be changing. Um, and from the mum's point of view, I guess every pregnancy is, is different or so. Um, and potentially, you know, the, the, that pregnancy is going to be different to the, to the first child. Um, and, and I guess the, 
the child is going to see their mum potentially um, experience things like morning sickness or food cravings or, you know, sort of be in a more heightened emotional state, as we know all those things happen during pregnancy. Um, so in saying that, um, do you think that um, in communicating the, the message to, to children to say you are going to have a baby brother or a sister, that sometimes that humour can actually help with communicating some of those messages to children at all? Yes, absolutely. Humour is great used in all sorts of situations and children lighten the mood as well. Um, listening, <laughs> listening to how they uh, articulate that they're going to be a big brother or sister to friends and family um, and how they, um, I guess, have their own outlook on what's happening and what's changing um, can be really good. And they are going to see their mother most likely going through some um, changes, different emotional states, of course, changes in physically and and perhaps some of those more difficult things like nausea and vomiting and, and all of that. Um, and I think it's really important that everyone tries to associate that with the pregnancy, not the baby. It's not the baby's fault that these things are yeah, happening good point. or changing. Yeah. And talking about humour, I know um, my parents have told me many times that when I was sat down as a child and I was told that I was going to have a baby brother or sister. Um, um, and I sort of, you know, I, I sat there apparently and had a bit of a, a think and I sort of just asked my parents, I said, that's great. You know, so where's a baby going to live? Uh, Cause this, this is our house. So obviously the baby's not going to live with us cause this is our, 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 where we live. And so, you know, those types of things. I mean, what, 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 I'm sure you've got plenty of stories having ha had to communicate this a few times to, to each one of your children. Um, and, and, Maybe also because when you were communicating, did you, um, when you had sort of more children, did you sit them all down together as well? Yeah, we did. So when we were having the fourth child, our youngest was three. Um, so she understood a lot more. And the oldest child was nine when the fourth child was born. Um, and so we did. We sat them down and said, you know, we're thinking about having another baby and, um, we were actually already pregnant at the time and we, you know, tried to include them in the decision making as well, I even guess. though that was <laughs> our, our decision. Um, and then a few weeks later, we told them we're having a baby and they were so excited and, um, you know, went and told everyone at school and kinder and, and things, anyone that they knew, um, and then just continued to update them on how things were going because it's, it is actually a very long time for children to wait until yeah. the pregnancy is complete and the baby is actually born. Yeah. And, and getting back to, I guess, you know, and in line with the article that you wrote as well, the transition from one to two children, um, I guess for an only child, the thought of having to share their world, um, and all their parents love and attention with a new baby or brother or sister can be, I guess, probably quite startling and it's a very big emotional transition. Um, now for some children, um, as we know that jealousy can play a little bit of a part depending on the child themselves. So I just wanted to know from your perspective, do you have any tips on how um, parents can sort of help um, sort of transition their child and or how to deal with maybe a child that has displayed some um, elements of jealousy? Um, yeah. When, when they are communicated and told this. Sure. Um, I think, again, including them as much as you can throughout the pregnancy and after the birth and letting them know that this is a really important new job that they've got being this big brother or sister. Um, it's a really important job and you really need their help um, can really, can really, really help them see a, a sense of responsibility and a sense of importance. The sense yeah, of importance I think helps the most because then they they really want to be part of your team, your family team, and work with everyone to make it to make it work. However, they are effectively being demoted. So when you have a new baby, the baby needs a lot more attention and um, has no ability to look after themselves at all. Whereas your toddler or preschooler can do bits and pieces themselves. And there are going to be times that you have to ask them to wait. Um, so. I guess just trying to keep it as positive as you can. Um, and when they show signs of jealousy, I guess it's important that we realise that that's probably expected to a certain degree. It doesn't mean that they can play on it or, or cause 
big issues because of it, um, those they need to be told that they can't do that. However, it is a fair response to have at the time, especially when their baby brother or sister starts trying to play with their toys or you know crawls over and knocks over something that they've made. That's going to happen and they're not going to be impressed. <laughs> quite natural. Do you think a lot of parents maybe experience some form of guilt um, when a child potentially is, um, you know, you're sort of going through a, a stage of jealousy at all? Yes, absolutely. I think parents, particularly mothers, feel guilt around so many different parts of parenting and, and being a mum. But I think introducing a new baby into the family is one of those times where they know they're not going to devote as much time to their first child. Um, but they also know that they're not going to be able to devote as much time to their new baby as what they did to their first baby. So there's a few areas of guilt. Um, however, you can't, you can't fix that. You can't um, change that. So it's just trying to explain things to the older child and remembering that that new baby doesn't know how much time you spent with their first, with the first baby. They don't know any different yeah, at good all. Good point. And I, I think that's really important to remember. And, and I think that's where some of the birth order stuff, uh, personality traits come from because they do have to wait a little bit longer to be fed sometimes because you're feeding a toddler or because you're dressing a toddler. Um, they don't get everything as quickly. And I think that can be a good thing. Um, I'm not suggesting neglect, obviously, but just waiting those couple more minutes at times, I think that really makes a big difference. Mm, and, you know, children are naturally inquisitive creatures anyway. Um, in your experience, have you found, I guess, the simple question of just why um, to be more common than any other questions that maybe parents receive um, at all? Is that something that you've, you've heard more, more than others? Yes, I think so. Um, and even around bringing home a new baby. A bit like your question around why, uh, where's your baby brother or sister going to live? Um, they will often come back with the why are we having a new baby or, well, or um, why do we need another child? Yeah, You've got me. <laughs> exactly. But that's the thing. Our, our world is perfect as it is. I get all the love and I get all the attention. I get everything on tap. Why does this need to change? So that's, you know, thinking about it logically is probably one of the most common questions. <laughs> And again, it's a fair, a really fair question for them to be asking. <laughs> they might not like your answer very much. So we <laughs> told our children that we wanted a bigger family. We wanted more children. We want a bigger family. And luckily they went with that. We kept it very positive. <laughs> uh, Lighthearted. Uh, yep. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get sort of bugged down to the details too much, I guess. But Exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, the whole thing about having a brother or sister is naturally has a lot of benefits too you know have you found maybe talking to, to, to your children about some of these benefits can actually sort of help them understand a little bit yes and the benefits I think the biggest benefit to them is that they're going to have a playmate that lives in their house yes um, and that they can be friends with forever uh, so I think explaining to them that even though the baby's very small now and can't do very much uh, they're going to be their best playmate they're going to be able to do this and they're going to be you know talk about the things that they love doing and how their new baby's going to love doing those with them too um, and that they just need to grow a bit more before that they can actually do that and thankfully babies love watching children they love watching children more than most things so your baby will actually start watching that toddler or preschooler and making them feel really special and I think those two things go really well in um, keeping the peace and making that child feel like they do have a really important role in their family. Isn't that just the magic of life, isn't it really? When you, when you think about mm. that, you know, and, and, and just, and they are the, the, the most beautiful moments in life when you see your children and growing together and having those moments when they are either holding or hugging or kissing one another. That's just, that's what it's I really guess the, special. That's what the magic of life really is all about. So now, get, getting back to the article and, and all of the great information that you have in there, you know, what really can parents sort of do before the birth um, to start to prepare for, um, like, for, I guess, for, for the new, new baby and, and that transition at all? 
So like we've sort of touched on a couple of times, including them in as much as you can so that they're learning about this new baby and the, the new changes. If you need to move them out of a cot that's going to end up being for the baby, great to do that sooner rather than later so that it's not seen as you know, taking from them for the baby. It'd be great yeah. if there was a couple of months in between. Um, if your first child is too young um, to move out of the cot, just get another cot. It's a, a, a necessity to have a safe sleep space for the new baby. Um, and then including them as much as you can in perhaps your antenatal appointments. Um, they can listen to the baby's heartbeat and be included. And most health professionals love including um, siblings yeah. um, and making them feel really special about it as well. Um, perhaps if it's a longer appointment or you have to have an ultrasound or something like that, if you can't take someone else to look after your, your toddler, then that might be a bit difficult. Um, but trying to just include them all, all of the time. And there's some great books as well that you can get about becoming a big brother or sister um, that are, again, really positive and talking about how exciting it's going to be and um, making it fun. Yeah. Um, I mean, is there any opportunity with some of the personalised books as well that, that parents can also personalise the book specific to the child to put their name into it as well? I think that's a nice little gift possibly. Yeah, that's parents a great, give the child. really good idea actually. Yeah, absolutely. Because that then becomes a keepsake as well, yes. which is lovely. Yeah. So we've listed in the article some of those tips that parents can be doing before the birth. Um, I just wanted to bring up something that's been in the back of my mind too. What about parents who are expecting twins or triplets? Do you generally find the conversations about multiple births just as easy about, um, you know, like, I guess, as, as a conversation about um, expecting one child or one, one, one baby? I guess it's the same or very similar conversations about you're going to be a big brother or sister, but it, explaining that there's going to be more than one baby is really important because if they've got friends or other family members that have had a baby, the majority are single, you know, one, one baby at a time. Um, so it's important that they understand that it's different. And I think it's also important to start trying a a little bit um, more linking them in with other family and friends as well. So making sure that other family and friends are involved in the care of that child because mum might, a lot of um, multiple births are premature births um, and sometimes there's a little bit more high risk around that pregnancy too and mum could be um, admitted into hospital for a little while. So it's a great time to try and make sure that your firstborn is able to sleep over at friends or family, you know, close close friends or family's houses and be cared for by them just to sort of start preparing them for that little bit more separation from mum um, or the primary caregiver, mum and dad really, because if twins perhaps are born a, a number of weeks early, there's going to be a lot of back and forth to the hospital with feeding and um, care of those twins and it would be very useful and easier for the parents, but also much gentler for your first child if they're already comfortable with going to somebody else's place for care. It's great advice. Yeah. And I guess what, what else can parents do after the birth then um, of, the, of their new baby to include the older child then? Well, something that we did was give our first child a doll uh, when she came to see her new baby brother at the hospital. And that worked really well in including her. So she had her baby and when I would be changing a nappy, she'd be changing the baby's nap, her doll's nappy. And when I bathed my baby, she would bath her baby. Um, so that worked really well. Again, and little boys love dolls as well. It's practising being a dad. So that's not uh, only for girls. Mm -hmm. um, Good to the hear. The other thing is <laughs> including them in as much as of the baby care that you can. So you might be able to say, can you go and get me a nappy from the baby's room? Can you go and get this? Can you help me with, can you sing a song to the baby while I run and get something? Um, they can really be included in so many ways in looking after the baby or just keeping the baby a bit distracted um, while you're getting other things done. And also, again, explaining to them their importance of being that big brother, sister, um, 
role in the family, keeping that going, that can really keep going forever um, because you want them to feel, um, I guess, a, a sense of responsibility, but but uh, feel special a place. being in that role. Yes. Yeah. 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 So then, I mean, what else can parents sort of do to help divide the attention between the two, two children then? I think having some one-on-one -on -one time with your firstborn every day is really important. Even when in those early days where you're not getting a lot of sleep, it doesn't have to be long. Even if you just read them a book, if they love li listening to books, read them a book just before bedtime or, you know, after you've put the newborn baby down to sleep, you might say, okay, we're having our special time now. Make a big deal about it, even if it's only going to be super short. Um, because they will feel like it's really special too. And you might even be preparing for that for a few hours before by saying, what are we going to do in our special time? Um, so that it becomes something that they, they wait for and look for every day um, and love. And, and also um, perhaps when dad's home, mum can take the, the older child out to the park or um, oh, there's lots of other ways around it, but just some one-on-one -on -one time with both parents, with both children. Yes, um, that's a great really, point. Really, really important for bonding as well. Um, but it's just, and I think a lot of fathers get a lot more time with the firstborn when the new baby is born for obvious reasons, um, particularly if the mum's breastfeeding. Um, it, it allows them some really special time to bond a bit more, as, a, a little bit more as well. Yeah. Um, there's a short paragraph that I would love to read out from the article. Here we go. This is quoting you now. Some mums worry that they already love their firstborn so much that they're not sure if they will have enough love or be able to share this with their new baby. But, but it's amazing how love works. Uh, even when you think you have given so much to, of your love to your first child, that there will be more. Sometimes it can take a little and a while to uh, develop. Either way, many mums are surprised that they find even more love for their new baby. I'd love to know what's been your experience with this. I, I think that was my concern going from one to two children, but I have heard so many uh, other mums be concerned about that as well. And it's really interesting. Love isn't like time. Time, we have this amount of time, we've got to fit everything in and share it all around. But love is infinite. So when you have another baby, you're not taking any love away from the first baby or, or child. Um, you're now, you've made more love for the next one. And like I said, sometimes it does take a little while to develop. Many women don't give birth and immediately feel that surge of love for the new baby. Even if they think they're beautiful and cute and, <laughs> and think they're kind of nice, love can take a few days or weeks to develop and that's fine as well. Um, but you will find more love uh, in, and you won't be robbing any love from your first child. Yeah. And I think it's just, um, it's good to remember that ultimately this time in your life um, and this time of having another child, I guess, is one of the most marvellous and just magnificent times in your life. So just, um, as you said, when you lead from love, everything sort of grows and expands and it is just a, a wonderful time um, and it, it is infinite. So that's, that's really well put. So thank you for, for sharing that. And as I mentioned before, we will have the link through to your article in the show notes because um, you sort of go into a lot more detail about what parents can do um, pre and post birth. Um, but if you, I guess, um, in this chat, were able just to, to summarise some of your key messages, um, what would they be? I think really enjoy this special time. Like you've mentioned, it's an amazing time in, in a family's life know that you can't do it all and that you should ask for help um, and there'll be friends and family around you that that actually really want to help and it um, they will not mind you asking them uh, no one's a super mum or a super dad for that matter um, and it's just an amazing thing seeing your first child develop into a big brother or sister your tiny child will all of a sudden look like a giant when you have a newborn baby. So you'll think of them still as your baby. And then when you have a brand new baby, all of a sudden they look huge. Um, it, it's an amazing development to your family. Um, so enjoy it. 
Oh, this is wonderful. Look, if parents have got any other questions specifically for you um, about anything that we've spoken about or any information that you have in the article, whereabouts can they find you? They can find me at belindajoyce.com and just send me a message. Thanks, Belinda. Love chatting to you as always. Take care and we'll speak soon. Thanks, Rach. Okay, bye.